The Art of Classical Greece and Archaic Greece The art of ancient Greece is usually divided stylistically into four periods, the geometric, archaic, classical, and Hellenistic. These periods carried their own specific qualities in their art and sculpture. The geometric age is usually dated from about 1000 BC. Although in reality little is known about art in Greece during the preceding 200 years, traditionally known as the Greek Dark Ages, the period of the 7th century BC witnessed the slow development of the archaic style as exemplified by the black figure style of vase painting. The onset of the Persian Wars is usually taken as the dividing line between archaic and classical periods, and the reign of Alexander the Great is taken as separating the classical from the Hellenistic period. Greek pottery is frequently signed, sometimes by the potter or the master of the pottery, but only occasionally by the painter. Hundreds of painters are, however, identifiable by their artistic personalities. Where their signatures haven't survived, they are named for their subject choices. This first art is called Three Revelies by Euthymides. As never Euphronios could do, wrote by painter Euthymides after painting his new Empora. Euthymides had a sense of achievement and was proud of his work. He challenged his friend and rival Euphronios. He would see Euphronios often, as well as other painters, in the potter's quarter in Athens. They would be curious to see each other's new work, sometimes with appreciation, sometimes with a bit of jealousy. In the evenings, they often had a good time together at the symposium, a kind of Greek male drinking party. They would drink wine mixed with water, become drunk and loud, and if drinking went on for too long, they might even start singing and dancing. This is most likely what was depicted on this pot. Euphronios indeed was a master potter and painter, and Euthymides knew that he would have full appreciation for his work. He thought, however, that his figures seemed much more lively, caught in a split moment of dancing. This next pot is Death of Sarpedon by Euphronios. Euthymides called out Euphronios <laughs> on his last pot, The Three Revelers, but the detail on Euphronios' pot is on a different level. In the Three Revelers, the movement you can feel from it is the key of Euthymides' boastfulness, and the reason he said Euphronios couldn't emulate it. This Greek painting depicts an episode from Homer's Iliad where Sarpedon dies. The winged figures are asleep in death. The two warriors standing stoically behind the winged figures were warriors that died previous to Sarpedon in the Battle of Troy. Euphronios, one of the first to work in red figure method, uses his simple but skillful technique to draw the hero's body at the moment it succumbs to death. Especially vivid are the three open wounds on Sarpedon's body from which blood spills to the ground. This pot is a black figure painting. It's a depiction of Achilles and Ajax playing a game. The detail in this black figure in Fora is amazing. Not only is it just the skill but the attention to little aspects that show you the story of the artwork itself. For example, it's Achilles on the left and Ajax on the right. You can see that Achilles is winning at the game they are playing from the numbers they speak out of their mouths. Achilles, 4, Tessera, and Ajax, 3, Try. This pot is a metaphor for how the story unfolds. Achilles and Ajax are friends, but Achilles in his higher role holds his spear loosely, as you can tell by the position of them, less parallel, while Ajax clenches his tightly, making them parallel to each other, showing a tighter grip. These little details are trying to get across Ajax's tension, or mini. If you look at his brow, it is thicker and more pronounced compared to Achilles's single incised line brow. One other detail that shows is Ajax's heels are ever so slightly lifted off the ground, showing that there is tension in his calf muscle. These subtle clues show the roles they play to the audience, also pointing out that Ajax is at a lower, more hunched over position, showing his power or position under Achilles in this story. Achilles dies a great death, an honorable death on the battlefield where he dies by his only weakness, his heel. Ajax outlives his powerful friend and carries Achilles off the battlefield. Ajax would ultimately be put to shame in a debate for Achilles' special armor made by the gods. During this loss, Ajax rages and kills Greeks, having been embarrassed by the loss. 
and later on ends up killing himself on his own sword, a shameful and pitiful death. The story would have been widely known by its audience and is a clear depiction of the story of Ajax and Achilles. To start the classical period, we will look at the Critios Boy, a marble sculpture. This classical sculpture, the Critios Boy, is known to be a very special sculpture, really capturing the realism of human sculpture. It was the first to be perfected in terms of proportion and lively human stance, showing that one leg is taking more of the weight and there's a shift in the hips. His facial features are soft and perfected. This comes to show the artistry that it took to do this. This next statue in the classical period is the statue of Warrior A. Showing how artists begin to shy away from realism, they started to exaggerate specific features, such as back muscles and pectoral muscles. They made the spinal column a deeper crevice than even possible as well as making his obliques unusually pronounced. This marked the time where exaggeration in human statues is more common after they had already mastered the realistic version of a human, Critios Boy. This was not good enough for them. He is made of bronze. This next statue in the classical period is a bronze sculpture. It's of Poseidon or Zeus. This masterpiece of classical sculpture was found by fishermen in their nets off the coast of Cape Artemisium in 1928. The figure is more than two meters in height. The statue is giving a pose of shifting weight and is exceptionally fit to show that the Greeks saw their gods as above average people. It is a statue that shows Zeus or Poseidon throwing a lightning bolt. He's made of bronze along with other statues in this period. This next statue is the discus thrower. It was part of a collection of arts at the Villa Borghese in Rome. It stood with three other athletes around the gladiator. The athlete is portrayed adjusting his position and the instant pride of hurling himself forward for a throw. He looks down. The head is modern addition by a sculpture, Pacetti. Concentrating on the accuracy of the coming throw, Tension in his body is shown by the curve of the back. The way the left hand is held back, the fingers gripping the discus, the contraction of the toes on the right foot, and the energy of the stance with both feet firmly planted on the ground shows that this was truly an athletic stance engaging a lot of muscles in the body. The Greeks developed three architectural systems called orders, each with their own distinctive proportions and detailing. The Greek orders are Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. The Doric style is rather sturdy, and its top, the capital, is plain. Their style was used in mainland Greece and the colonies in southern Italy of Sicily. The Ionic style is thinner and more elegant. Its capital is decorated with a scroll-like design, a volute. This style was found in eastern Greece and the islands. The Corinthian style is seldom used in the Greek world but often seen on Roman temples. Its capital is very elaborate and decorated with acanthus leaves. The Parthenon is one of the great temples of many. The Parthenon would become the largest Doric Greek temple, although it was innovative in that it mixed the two architectural styles of Doric and the newer Ionic. Other sophisticated architectural techniques were used to combat the problem that anything on that scale of size, when perfectly straight, seems from a distance to be curved. To give the illusion of true straight lines, the columns lean ever so slightly inwards, a feature which also gives a lifting effect to the building, making it appear lighter than its constructed material would suggest. Made of marble, a light reflecting material with thinner columns than the prominent temples that preceded it, the Parthenon had something of heavenly aura about it. 